Good afternoon, my name is Alex Woods. I'm a civil litigator. I specialise in the field of financial mis-selling, bringing payment protection insurance claims against lenders on behalf of consumers. And I'm also increasingly working with insolvency practitioners to litigate, offer legal advice and assistance to insolvency practitioners and to process payment protection insurance within IVAs. And I consult with a law firm here in Norwich. This is a um, new premises that we're expanding into. And I've also have experience of setting up a payment protection IVA processing unit at a law firm in London over the last year. I have about three years experience litigating these cases. Now, today, um, I want to address a question that was asked of me by a reasonably large insolvency practitioner a couple of weeks ago, which was, why can't I just write a letter? Um, by which he meant payment protection insurance, claiming the money back from the banks can't be that difficult, can it? Um, I think he's probably angling for a little bit of free legal advice and probably thinking about setting up his own unit um, within, the, with, within his practice, which was fine. Uh, he wanted to refer, introduce 200 odd bankruptcies to us and um, I don't feel as if I did him, um, I did his question justice at the time, so I'm now going to try and address it because I think it's quite an interesting question today. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is to take a bite out of this apple, and you'll see what this all means by the end of the video post. Mm. I got that in the station this morning. I don't like these red ones, but I was in a hurry. I have taken a bite out of the said apple. Now, in the bin. <laughs> right. There, it'll all become clear by the end of the post. Right. There are two ways of answering the question. Uh, I'm then going to analyze the, those two ways of answering the question and then conclude. So the, probably the first thing to say is, um, I work reasonably closely with a medium-sized claims management company that processes, has been processing three figures, not four figures, worth of, at best, of pain protection insurance claims over the past three or so years. I hope I'm not breach of any Official Secrets Act in disclosing that on this post. Um, and, you know, they simply write a letter. I've got some samples here to the bank. It's one page. It sketches in brief outline what the nature of the complaint is. They're self-employed. Um, they didn't ask for it. They've got a previous... Um, they've got existing insurance with their employer, they're a nurse or a policeman, etc, etc, etc. You kind of flag up one particular feature about your client. These are not PPI IVA cases, of course, these are direct consumer cases. And you bang off your complaint to the, um, the bank in question, to the bank's complaints department in question. And Lloyd's have a football-pitched sized office in Wales um, which handles their pain protection insurance complaints. And if you're lucky, they investigate it. And yes, this, this gentleman, this insolvency practitioner who wanted to do 200 bankruptcies, you know, yes, home improvements loan, 10 grand, three grand of PPI, upfront single premium, standard sort of thing, Bob's your uncle. Thank you very much for your complaint. We've adjudicated your complaint and here's a check for you know, £3,000 plus statutory interest at 8%. Okay, so at, at one level, the answer to the question is, yeah, uh, once you've got a little bit of a template letter, you probably will populate it with a little bit of detail relating to that particular consumer. Um, but otherwise, bang. And as I say, this particular claims management company is turning over somewhere around... Three. I don't want to be too intrusive. I mean, he, he was telling me this information over the past couple of days. But, you know, he has got a little mini factory going quite successfully. Um, so, 
at one level, it is as simple as writing a letter. However, at another level, it ain't. Now, I'm going to just uh, illustrate by referring to some of the cases that I've been running over the past three years, two in particular. This here is, I don't know if you can see it, it's, um, I keep a, a log of my completed cases, my completed payment protection insurance cases. These are more often of a more complex nature, uh, often so I can persuade clients that um, are more than likely not to win their cases, and um, to date this figure gives an 85% success rate. It's actually inched up a bit recently because I've had a couple recently settle. So um, uh, I don't run all that many cases, but I uh, tend to be reasonably successful at those that I do. Well, at least I don't run all that many cases at the moment because I'm relatively small, but um, hopefully things are, are, are looking up and the operation should expand. The operation is expanding. So um, the first case was, an, I'm just refer to two of these cases. Um, some of them are confidential because of gagging orders that the banks have made a sign before giving really, really rather handsome payouts to the, to the clients. Um, one was an MBNA credit card, and it went all the way to the courtroom doors in June of last year. Uh, the client was a, a ticket inspector for the London Underground, quite a determined individual. MBNA, you know, picked the wrong uh, uh, fight in this instance. Uh, they told him that he had taken out the pain protection insurance on a particular day uh, in 2004. And that, um, there, and it had happened over a telephone call. The implication in the letter was that he had actually phoned them up and asked for the payment protection insurance to be added to his credit card. Of course, as we know, as we now know, many of these companies were setting up their own little mini call centers to try and flog payment protection insurance to existing customers, which is why PPL often mysteriously appears on your credit card statement on a you know undefined date, so he, they rejected his complaint. Uh, he, he he just was adamant that he he'd not asked for it. So uh, it took us some time. It took us about a year to get to the courtroom doors. During that year, they went from rejection to an offer of around about three thousand seven hundred, up to about four thousand something. And then at the courtroom doors, uh, they capitulated at the courtroom doors. We then had another hearing to deal with the issue of quantum. And at those court, we had another set of courtroom doors, Central London County Court. Uh, it was rather a fun day um, because their junior barrister from Gough Square Chambers spent most of the time on his mobile to a Bank of America executives up in Manchester, I think it was. They even sent down a couple of kind of dudes to... I don't know, create an atmosphere around the proceedings, or perhaps just to check out, perhaps that's me being a bit suspicious to intimidate the client. But um, so, uh, you know, we had all of this palaver for a small, what was, had been allocated to the small claims track, but I was determined to see it through and get it reallocated to the fast track. Anyway, at the courtroom, I mean, this wasn't like at the courtroom, this was like in and out of the judge's chambers all afternoon. Um, we got a result for the client of, a th as, as memory serves me correctly, £6,750. And, they, and then six months later, they ended up paying our legal bill. Um, so there you have a case, uh, and, and I will now just uh, it, it further illustrate the point by referring to another case that I ran. Uh, a credit card company again. Um, this one was Creation Financial Services, and this was an old, quite an old credit card. So the first one, you know, a semi of a semi fraudulent nature, frankly. And um, this one um, was uh, an issue of limitations, if you like, because the lady in, lady client in question had taken out the uh, store card when she went into um, a clothes shop in order to buy a dress for a particular function and they sold her the store card and they sold her the pain protection to stop the store card in 1993. Um, so Evercheds were instructed and again, it, this one took, uh, it's probably the longest case I've had because uh, it took two years. 
Uh, the client ended up getting £12,000 compensation. And um, again, actually, it was the day before the hearing that we were in negotiations with Eversheds, who had, uh, taking instructions from their client, had inched up from F off its last century mates we aren't about to settle your you know a claim from the distant past besides we weren't ready there weren't even regulators haven't even been invented in 1993 so we had big arguments about which um, insurance body was the regulator at the relevant time in 1993 you know bish bosh wham bam bang bash um, so we ended up with a £12,000 payout coming up from single figures, you know, I think probably the first discussions were around about the, um, I don't know, four, five, six, seven grand figure. So I, from nothing, the client would have got nothing had they um, complained to the bank. I think they already had an exhausted FOS's complaints procedure because FOS had told them that the claim was so old that really that it was sort of outside their jurisdiction. So those are two uh, perhaps exceptions you might be thinking to the issue of you know payment protection insurance complaints um, and um, you know whether or not it really is an issue of simply banging off a letter. Uh, but I don't think that those two cases um, are as exceptional as all that. And I kind of slightly hesitate as I draw those, those conclusions because I do live in, a, in another world from, um, a lot of my friends would say, I do live in another world, uh, full stop. Um, I, I think it's a better world. Um, so, but the fact is, I do live in a little bit of a, a litigation world, and I don't handle all that many cases. However, I do have a window onto the, the bigger world, the claims management world, the um, turn the handle and pump out the, the, the DOSH type massive claims management company world. Um, so you might want to say, you might want to take what I'm saying with a pinch of salt. But I did, I have managed to obtain from a, a claims management company some examples, and this claims management company was unlike a lot of claims management companies because, and you may be starting to think now about what was that guy doing with the apple and that little stunt, um, because they've, they've, they're a claims management company with a conscience, um, or they're very clever and they're just fooling me because they want, they want to, um, to, get in, to get into business with me. Um, but I've dealt with a lot of claims management companies and most of them just want to turn the handle and, 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 and find their businesses and they want to generate um, revenues. Um, but this one has produced, I'm just flicking through here, HSBC, Barclay card. Um, I've noted this looks like a derisory offer here. Um, Barclays. Barclay card again, RBS, American Express, had, didn't really sell PPI too badly, RBS, RBS, um, very low interest, obtained statements. Um, I've basically been through um, these, and I've, they're a sample set, so they are the perhaps the exception rather than the rule, of payment protection insurance claims where the banks have made reasonably derisory offers. And I um, have a particular case now that I'm litigating in which the bank, um, I won't mention this one, it's some sort of conf confident confidentiality issues with it, it's, it's, a, it's an existing client. But the bank is prepared to refund all of the premiums you have paid on the policy over the last six years as a gesture of goodwill, which amounts to £1,531.44. I have done an analysis of, I've obtained the credit card statements, and I've done an analysis of the, 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 the true cost 
of payment protections on that customer's particular credit card. And I have, well, I've described in my letter before action, uh, described their offer as surprising. Uh, it failed to include interest, both interest associated with the account as well as statutory interest. And it failed to include premiums for any earlier periods. Banks are fond of using the six-year rule, which was brought into place to ensure that banks had at least six years of statements available should clients make a request under the Data Protection Act. They've used it as a way of creating a cut-off point for themselves so they don't have to go into their archive factories um, and, and you know, dredge up old statements, which they do actually have. I've written to one very large credit card company on two separate occasions and got the first six months, the first time I wrote, and the second, sorry, the first six years, the most recent six years, first time I wrote, and then I wrote again, and I got the six years, of a full 12 years set of credit card statements. So that gives you something of a, a flavour I hope, of the way that the banks, who, let's not forget, you know, are large um, organisations who have insecurities about their balance sheets, are weathering a tumultuous and turbulent epoch in terms of, you know, in, um, in economic terms, and who will do all they possibly can to shore up that balance sheet. And I'm afraid, as any big animal uh, who's insecure about its survival will do, will put its own self-interest first. And that means, not in all cases, not with all banks, but certainly those that some of those that are under threat, um, and I think actually some of them are still under threat, they um, will make, will try and get away with paying out as small amounts of pain protection as they possibly can. And they will encourage uh, consumers who I'm afraid are at times somewhat dumb or afraid or they just want to grab the money. So the bank will dangle a relatively derisory offer out there They'll often, perhaps, they'll write directly to the consumer in order to cut out the claims management company sometimes. Certainly, they have a practice of sending the money directly to the consumer. And they'll cut out the claims management company in order to try and encourage, because they want to get rid of the problem as cheaply as possible. I, I'm teaching you to suck eggs here. It goes without saying. Therefore, uh, I've now started to have, I had a conversation with uh, an introducer uh, who goes out there, tries to generate business uh, online and by means of um, websites and they don't call call by the way the claims management companies that I work with uh, yeah I have um, ha was having this conversation with this introducer and he said he wanted to know he wanted to pick my brains what do I do about secondary claims and I'm like secondary claims. He means claims where the consumer or the claims management company acting on behalf of the consumer has uh, accepted a derisory offer and then realised subsequently that they were entitled to a far bigger payout. There are so many exceptions in a way that uh, the exceptions have kind of become the, the rule almost. So, you know, you, you've now got People, claims management um, companies and producers, you know, coining the expression secondary claims. You know, I, I therefore believe, and I will conclude by saying that I think you kind of, and try and make it practical to come back to the original question, that uh, if you are a big insolvency practitioner, uh, you will probably want to form an association with a large claims management company, and you will probably want to process payment protection insurance complaints within IVAs, within bankruptcies, when completed IVAs, um, or, well, at least within bankruptcies and open IVAs. Um, you will probably want to you know, play the volume game and 
basically take the bite out of the apple. I think if you are a, and you know, fine, you're in the business of generating profits and dividends to your shareholders, prim primarily. Um, if you are, at, 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 you know, almost at the cost of anything else, if you're playing a more of a long-term view, if you're a small or you're a medium, medium-sized insolvency practitioner, or if you're a reasonably uh, medium-sized law firm, then you probably, uh, you may well take a different view. And, and I think that the offers that are being made and are being accepted by consumers, often by claims management companies on behalf of consumers, are low. And are particularly, for example, in the case of credit cards, particularly where the, the person's had the credit card for a long period of time. Um, and I think that a self-respecting professional business uh, would perhaps partly because they want, would want to avoid um, any bum biters in the terms of, of consumers and claims management companies coming to mark down the line because they've you know, wrongly set off or they've accepted low offers. Partly, um, partly simply you know, because I do believe there is quite a lot to be mined. I think the claims management industry is taking a bite out of the apple and there's so much more there. Um, before you even get to, to litigation. So my conclusion, to, my answer to the question of whether it is, isn't it as simple as sending a letter is yes and no. But yes, if you, in the volume game, if you aren't too concerned about, um, you know, really mining the payment protection insurance claim for its full value uh, and no if you aren't. One final note on the issue of bankruptcy in particular since this particular client asked me about the bankruptcy um, category of payment protection insurance processing is that with uh, bankruptcies in general I would have probably said to him as a caveat to everything I've just said we're trialling bankruptcies uh, because of two uh, kind of threats, if you like. Um, the first is the official receiver, rightly or wrongly, has given guidance. I think it's, um, you can find it, you know, on, insolvency, on the Insolvency Services website. I think it's 31.9.208A. <laughs> and their guidance is the... Um, the lender, when someone goes into the, the pay, payment protection insurance uh, claim vests in the trustee in bankruptcy, the liquidator at the time, and that, that um, the trustee should first invite the lender to set off. Uh, offer the lender, the, the, the creditor where the debt office hasn't been sold, the opportunity to set off. So whether or not you agree with that, that is a government organisation that is giving out guidance. And of course the second reason is I, my general view is an IVA is a different animal to a bankruptcy. Insolvency practitioners have often encouraged consumers to think that it's quite something quite different from bankruptcy and that their debts will be completely extinguished at the time that the um, IVA completes. So I, th I just think that an IVA is a different proposition when it comes to the point of dealing with payment protection insurance claims. Although there are many with you know, far greater experience than I in this sector who, who would probably disagree. So thank you very much for taking the trouble to listen in on this video post. Um, I'm at this law firm as premises in Norwich today. Um, and I'm the, uh, the next time I post which I own to post on a weekly basis where possible, will be on the area of set-off. And what I will be looking at is letters I've been getting from lenders with particular clauses in, which gives a clue as to the approach that lenders and their legal departments are taking towards the issue of set off specifically within individual voluntary arrangements and bankruptcies. Thank you very much. Until next time.